Hello, welcome everybody, and finally I've been able to find the time to get out Tainted Grail, the Fall of Avalon. I've had this box sitting, I don't know, is it a year, more than a year? I had a quick look in it, went, yeah, looks like the components are there, put it on the side and then just never ever got around to it. So here we are, Tainted Grail, let's see if we can have a go at getting started with this game. I, uh, I must say, I remember in the campaign when they were asking which neoprene mats, which designs and that we would like, and just anybody else who's got this, am I the only person who thinks that this just looks washed out and, you know, I mean, there's, there's images on here, but you can't even really make them out. I'm s slightly wondering if my mat's actually faulty uh, and those prints were never on very well to start with, but... Ah, I should have checked it at the time, but um, pretty weak looking graphics. Okay, so let's see what we've got. So we've got the, the great thick exploration journal. I'm going to really struggle with some of these names, aren't I? Nime, I'd say. N-I-A-M-H. Nime? Niam? I don't know. Let's say Nime. I think, I think it was an early bird special. Not 100% sure. Got this little, this little bit of extra stuff. I've not, not opened any of this stuff yet because I don't tend to open things like that until I'm ready to go. We've got the save sheet, pad, bunch of those. Don't know if I'll ever get around to playing it that many times, but uh, we'll see. Rule book. Nice, big, thick rule book. You know my criteria, dark font colour on a light background. This is... Mm, the background could be a little bit lighter, it's not too bad, uh, it's certainly printed nicely, I can read that quite easily. Um, again, slightly paler background would have made that really pop, but um, it's got the rule book, it's got a nice component list there, so quite easy to uh, check through your uh, contents of your box. We've got a start here guide. Now this is great, so I'm hoping that this is going to just help us get going really quick, dead easy and get stuck into the game. So we'll just put that to the side, we'll come back to that in a minute. We've got our player boards, yeah, these are separate, but uh, I just found it easy to keep them in there for packing. And then one thing that you need to bear in mind is, if you look at this contents, you'll see that it's only got four miniatures for the heroes. But if you actually look at your box, if you had the, uh, how did we agree we were going to say it? Nime, if you had Nime as part of your pledge, or Niam, you'll find that she is actually in the box as well. So there she is. So don't panic, don't look for an extra box. She's in there. Probably by this point, most of you will have opened this a year ago and been playing it and this is all redundant. But anyway. Let's get started. Let's see what we need to do with the get started here guide and we'll take it from there. Ah, right, this open and play guide will help you set up and start your first single player adventure. Excellent, well, that's what we're hoping for. We've got some flavour text, I'll come back to that later. Unpack your models. To start, take your character models, one Menhir model and one dial. There you go, we'll use the same one that they've got sort of sad looking one. There we go. Everything it says to do, we have done so far. Yeah, the four travels of the characters, great. Ordinary people, blah, blah, blah. Then there's a bit of description about what each one is. Not gonna read all of that. The hooded statue is the Menhir. Its origin and purpose will be revealed, great. You can only explore parts of the island in range of an active menu, so there's one thing. Each menu has a space to hold a dial. These octagonal tokens have several purposes. They count down to the moment the menu fades away. They can be tossed like coins and are used by many special rules. Okay. In this open and play tutorial, you're going to play as Bior. Bior's high health and combat prowess can save inexperienced players from some of the mistakes. So it says set Bior's model aside, one air model and one dial Put them in front of you, put the rest of the models back in the box. Okay, well, why did you make me take them all out then? <laughs> right, so there's one there that's with his dial. There's Bior with his hammer. We don't need those after all, so I'll just put them straight back in the box. Okay, we've put the models away. 
We've got his board. Let's turn the camera down a bit so we can see that a bit more clearly. What else do we need? It says we need to unpack some universal markers, the red ones. There's some purple ones as well. So we've got a few red ones. Just says grab a few. It says there's purple ones that we leave in the box, which each purple one is worth five red ones. So that's fine. Take the character tray. Yep, got that. Uh, let's see. Energy. Bop. Your basic stamina consumed by travel, combat and exploration. It's regenerated each day as long as you eat food and rest. Health. Pretty obvious. Your physical condition. And terror. Your creeping madness. Once it reaches the top, you start to go insane. Some other stuff. Whenever your terror reaches the red zone, you're on the brink of madness and attach the you're going insane card to your character tray. It also says here that when you're on the brink of death, you attach the you're dying card to your character tray. So... We will worry about that later on if it happens. Set up your character. Take Bureau's character tile shown. So it shows us here. Turn the tile so the setup Bureau side is face up. That's this side. And it instructs you how to prepare the blue character tray for Bureau. First, mark the starting level of Bureau's attributes. Place red markers in the attribute slots along the left and right edge of the tray. According to the instructions on the character tile, you then find a T-shaped health marker in the box. Place this marker in the starting health track slot, highlighted by two red chevrons, slot nine for Bior. So, we have a look here. Okay, I can see the two red chevrons there for the health tracker. So we'll put that there. Kind of straightforward. And then we'll use these to help us set up. So we want uh, two red cubes over here. That's two, yeah, then we want one in courage, one in practicality, see that down there, yeah. One in caution, caution is over on the other side of the board, one in caution, we get uh, nothing in empathy, and nothing in spirit spirituality. We need three food, so again, three in the food one, and one wealth. That would appear to be it. Let's have a look at the flavour text. Bior, a local smith known for short temper and incredible strength. He does his best to conceal a festering, unhealable wound in his side that he received under mysterious circumstances. Hmm, maybe we'll get to know what happened. Okay. So we've set up the board. Now I find that energy and terror tracks of your character trace situated on the left and right of the edge place universal markers in the starting slots highlighted by the two red chevrons so terror starts at zero and energy starts at six which is just below these bonus plus one plus two plus three slots insert the tile into the tray already done that unpack the open and play deck okay right okay we've got a bunch of decks I was very careful. Ah, here we go. I was careful not to open anything so I can get open and play. Do not shuffle. There you go, everybody. Do not shuffle. You need to be careful. I imagine if I drop this now, it's going to really mess everything up. So, I'm going to be careful. Specially marked 35 card deck. It includes all standard size cards you'll need in this tutorial. Find and open this deck now. Please don't shuffle or alter in any way. Vid. Set up combat and diplomacy decks. So there's our shuffle, do not shuffle. Sorry, there's our open play, do not shuffle deck. Set up the common diplomacy decks. Remove the top card from your open and play deck. Below it, you can see your combat deck. Okay, let me just move this over a bit so we can see. So, there's the top card. Just taking that off. Just as saved encounters on the bottom. But, right, combat. It says there should be 15 of these. So, let's have a look. That's quite a lot. Now, oh, there we go. Diplomacy kicks in somewhere. There's diplomacy. Let's just check. We've got 15. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 10, 11, 12, 30, 40, 15, right, 15 combat cards, boom. And then we should have diplomacy, 15, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay, there's our 15 diplomacy cards. And then we have our, what are these, first encounter cards. 
set your combat cards to the left of your character tray okay and set your diplomacy cards to the right of your character tray next to the diplomacy orientated attributes oh okay i see what they're saying so combat you know courage aggression practicality yeah okay don't think it really matters where you set your cards but there you go the last remaining cards are the four first encounters each of a different color place them to the side face down your first encounter text should face up okay so we just stick those over the side in a standard Tented Grail game, you will be asked to set up four encounter decks before each chapter. The green deck is mostly used in the wilds. Let's bring this over here. Mostly used in the wilds and contains natural threats such as wild animals or legendary beasts. Many of them give food. The grey deck contains dangers related to the world of man such as brigands and people driven to insanity by the weirdness. Many of these encounters give items or wealth. The purple deck contains supernatural threats. You will have to discover its significance yourself. Ooh. And the blue deck is where you'll find non-combat challenges that may happen every time you visit a settlement. They're resolved using a special diplomacy deck. However, in this tutorial, each of these decks will contain only a single card. Then it says step nine, take seven starting location cards. Find a deck of oversized cards in the box. These large cards are the locations you will explore during the game. That's got to be these. Get our location cards. I think these are just player aids on the top. Icon glossary. Yeah, but these are player aids. Combat overview. That's got to be a location. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's got to be a location. Take locations numbered 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, 106 and 107. Okay, that's easy. We've got those. Set them aside. This is the deck for our tutorial game. Set up your starting location. Place farm out location 01 in front of you above the character tray. Map side up. Okay. Well, let's just put this here. Right, well that's got to be what these spaces on this mat are for, to put cards in. This is your home. Place your character model on this location card. Done. No. Then place the menu on the location card. Put a dial in the base of the menu so the number 8 is at the front. This menu will go dark 8 days from now. Right, I don't know if you can see that, but I've put the 8 there at the front. Not easy to see, should be a lot easier when it's painted. We'll just put that there and that there, okay. Whenever you reveal a new location, make sure to familiarize yourself with the action on its front. For example, Cornarct allows you to earn some reputation once per day. Additionally, take note of symbols under the name of the location. There are three possibilities. Okay, so we need to have a look at this, here we go. So there's three possibilities. This symbol, Menir, means a Menir may be enabled and placed on this card, okay? Then the green symbol here with the sort of hut image on. Settlement means this area is inhabited. Some actions are only possible in settlements and some only outside of them. Finally, we've got this symbol, which is dreams. It means that spending a night in this location reveals either a dream or a nightmare. Build the starting map section, which is where we're at now in this uh, guide. It's time to expand your map. In a standard game, whenever you travel to a new location, you will attach new location cards to its sides, matching their keys to the keys on the edge of your location. Important, you will only be able to attach locations that are adjacent either directly or diagonally to a location with an active menhir. For now, attach charred conclave to the right edge of your starting location. I mean, this is kind of, you can see the number on the card here, but you can see it has numbers here telling you exactly which cards to put in place. I'm going to have to move this whole map this way a bit. There we go. Let's get this out of the way. We want Warriors Fair to its left edge. Oh, you can't see this too well there, can you? There we go. Attach Forlorn Swords, which is 105. 
to the bottom edge and Hunter's Grove 102 to the top. Set three different oversized help cards in front of you. So these will be the help cards, order of the day, icon glossary, combat overview. Okay, so I've put those. I know you can't see them, but I've just put them there. Easy access for me whenever I need them. Double check your setup. So it gives us a nice little picture of what it should look like. So does it look like that? Um, there's the three card. Well, it doesn't look exactly like it because I didn't move my diplomacy card down. There we go. Let's try and be, let's conform. There we go. So now, yeah. I think it looks pretty close to theirs. I've got my little pile of bits here. Part one, start of the day. It's now dawn. Bjor is ready to start his journey. Perform your first start of the day routine. Follow the order listed on the green help card. The card first asks you to remove expired menhirs and locations out of the menhir range. The only menhir on the map has a dial. It's not expired and all revealed locations are adjacent so we don't have to discard them. So let's see. Order of the day. Remove the expired menhirs and discard locations that are out of range, that's fine. Reduce all time and menhir dials and remove time tokens. So there aren't any time tokens. So before we've done anything, we already need to change this dial down to seven. Seems a bit naughty, we haven't actually had an eight yet, but never mind. Uh, reveal the next event card. So according to our instructions over it says in a standard game you would now reveal an event card but this tutorial has its own event card printed below. Read it. Quest. Speak with Connart's blacksmith, Erfir. Hint. To meet Erfir you have to explore the Connart farmhold location. Okay, so that's our quest. Reveal the next way. Right, move guardians. There are no guardians to move so you don't have any items. Uh, Oh, there we go. Pick active items and secret cards. We don't have any. So we can skip the rest of the... So there's nothing else to do. Part two. Do you know what I didn't do, which I should have done? I didn't read the flavour text first. So let me go back, just because we've started now. We're actually starting the game. So let's see if I can read this weird writing. They still call this place a farmhold, even though barren fields provide little food and crumbling walls offer no protection. The last relic of the glory days of Connaught is its menhir, always adorned with red ribbons, lit by candles, and with a daily offering at its gnarled feet. As long as the menhir repels the weirdness, the townsfolk are ready to endure anything. But last night, the weirdness came closer than ever before. A man was lost, following the call of his future self, a house on the outskirts of town has turned inside out, its furniture grown into a bloated outer shell, like barnacles on the side of a boat. For many hours the air tasted of metal and sour milk. Now people say your guardian menhir is failing, like many others all over the land. For you, the night was even worse. The festering wound in your side throbbed as if something tried to tear itself free, and join the rolling clouds of weird outside the town. In the morning, a boy comes running to your shack. Master Effer needs to see you. Move, you big goof. You chase the brat away with a well-aimed throw of a boot and immediately start to regret it as the boot lands in a deep puddle outside your door. Okay, have our quest. Right, so the first exploration. After start of the day, characters may perform actions. Each action in Tainted Grail is marked with a special icon that also shows its cost. As his first action, Bjor should visit Ephir. To do so, explore the Connaught Farmhouse location. To initiate this action, pay one energy. So we move the marker on your energy track one slot lower. So where does it tell us that he can do this action? Is it on the card? It's on the card. There you go. I wondered where they'd put it. Let's just uh, see if we can just zoom in here. Hey. There we go. Come back. Let's try and get everything in frame. 
can't get everything in frame. Let's try again. Okay, I'm going to have to do it like this, I think. So, it says it's going to cost us one energy, so we move that down by one. In a standard game, exploration would direct you to text on the other side of the location card, but this tutorial won't spoil any stories from the campaign. Oh, that's good, no spoilers. Instead, go to the tutorial exploration journal printed on the last page of the exploration journal book. That's the great big ring-bound book that we saw earlier. So, we go to the last page. Yeah, if you go right to the back, you'll find um, you come across this. Find the appropriate section, 101, Kunhaus Farmhold. Here we are. Exploration journal entries for most locations in Tainted Girls start with an introduction that leads to your decisions. Read the location introduction first. So here we go. A deep feeling of loss pervades Connacht, from dilapidated farms to the sunken eyes of those who remain in town. The manier in the market is nearly extinguished. Still, this place is the only home you ever knew. Now you're ready to choose what to do in this location. Below are two options redirecting you to different verses or paragraphs. Each has a requirement. The first time you come here, you're only able to choose the first option because the second one requires a specific part of a status, which is story triggered, marked on your tutorial save sheet. If you are here for the second time, you should already have part two of the required status, so only the second option is accessible to you. Make your choice now. So it hasn't told us anything about a tutorial save sheet. Well, you know what? We'll come back to that another time. So it gives us two options as it said it would. Make your choice. Speak with your master, only if you don't have any part of the surprised errand status. Go to verse one. Or complete your mission requires part two of the surprising errand status to let you go to verse two. Well, we don't have that, so we have to go to verse one. Her fear is up earlier than usual. As you enter, he hides a large pack behind a curtain and turns to you with a wide smile. You here, lad. Good. Hope you're ready to stretch your legs a bit. I hear a star fell near whitening and a local tanner picked it up. It's a solid ingot, large as your dingy head. I'd rather not have it fall into the hands of some other smith. You nod. Falling stars are a bad omen for most simple folk, but they always excite blacksmiths and armourers. After all, the legendary Excalibur was forged from one of those cold shards of distant skies. After all, the legendary Excalibur was forged from one of these cold shards of distant skies. Soon you depart, walking down the sloping fields towards the mist-covered forest. With some rations, your trusty hammer, and a purse of silver Urfir gave you. Before stepping into the shadows of the trees, you take one last look back at the ancient statue towering above shacks and houses. How much longer can this tired old thing protect Connacht? Gain part one of the surprising errant status. Gain one wealth and exploration. So we're going to put the one wealth in there, so we've got two now. Exploration ends. Mark it on your tutorial save sheet. Well, I had a good look around for this tutorial save sheet and um, <laughs> I think my expectations were maybe a bit uh, too high because it turns out there is no separate sheet. I, I looked through the rest of the box and everything trying to find one. Turns out the tutorial save sheet is just here on this uh, get started guide at the back. I'm really not sure we actually needed one of these. Tutorial save sheet, it's just this. We've done number one, next time it'll be number two. I, I'm not sure we really needed that. I think I can remember that I've read uh, section one. But anyway, on the bigger sort of proper missions, you, you use that uh, sheet, it's gonna help you remember what you've done and how you did it. But anyway, that's all it is. Don't go hunting for it, if you're like me. Don't go looking through the box, flipping through everything, trying to see if there's a little sheet somewhere. It's just this. Anyway, now that we've gained that first uh, exploration. We have um, taken a mark and put, we've already put the uh, universal mark into the wealth slot, so we've done that. Um, and then we should return to the game and go to part three, first travel. So let's go back to this book, book leaflet, sorry, more accurate. We've done this. Part three, first travel. Your exploration is now finished and you have a new task. It's time to start moving Bjor towards his destination, the cursed farmhold known as the Whitening. 
So as we know from the exploration journal, the whitening is northeast of your village. To plan the journey, let's study all revealed locations. Okay, well, to the east is the charred conclave. It says draw a grey encounter when you enter this location, once per day. The wind that caresses the long grass of this desolate highland also carries the smell of burnt flesh. Delightful. Reminds me I'm hungry. What else? It's a dangerous place. It will trigger an automatic encounter. Yeah, as soon as Boa enters it. The rule marked with the lightning icon, which is, that's what we just saw there when I read it, draw a grey encounter. So, okay, so that's a dangerous place. To the north is Hunter's Grove. If we have a look at Hunter's Grove, we can see this has got slightly different activity here. Gather food, gain two food, draw on one green encounter. In ages past, only the Druids were allowed into the grove for good reason that is now forgotten. So, looks like that's a decidedly safer option. It says on the structures here, it says uh, a place where Bjork can gather some food. This looks better, doesn't it? Well, so we perform the travel action, we pay one energy. Move Bjork into Hunter's Grove. So we move north into Hunter's Grove. As you arrive there, check if there are any locations connected to the Hunter's Grove that you could reveal. So that just means looking on the card, we can see that there are some locations to the north and to the west and to the east. It says you may reveal any locations that are, and then there's a list, connected to your current location with direction keys. Yep. Yeah. We can see the numbers for those on the edge of the card. In range of an active menu. So that means they have to be adjacent, either in a straight line or diagonally. So we can reveal the cards to the left and to the right because they're diagonally adjacent to this space with the manure in it but we can't reveal the one to the north because that would be uh, too far away so this is where the other two location cards that we had to uh, pull out earlier on come into play we have location card 106 four dweller mounds and location 107 the whitening so put that one there the numbers on the cards make it really easy to choose where to put them. So the cards are in place. Part four now. So we've put those first location action. Bjor's new location as an action. Gather food. Food is an important resource that you consume at the end of each day, so gathering more won't hurt. To activate the location action, pay its cost. Two energy. So we're going to pay two more energy. That brings us down to three to two. And I assume, let's see what it says, we're going to... Um, Take two markers and place them in the food slot of your character tray. The action also allows you to draw one green encounter. Right, so we'll put these two in the food slot first. And then we're going to draw one green encounter. So we, we only have this little pack of four that we, we pulled out. So there is the green one. Place it face up so that you have plenty of free space to the right of the encounter card. Interesting. So what have we got? We've got a mist shaped vermin. Oh right, not misshaped, mist shaped vermin. The encounter value is four. We need that many cubes to win. The attribute keys place the first card you play here. So this is why it wants us to leave space to the right. Combat pool, put every gained cube over here to the left. You can't call yourself a true adventurer until you've killed one. Combat table, the number of cubes determines the enemy's attack. Okay, opportunity, run away and loot. We can get one food. I don't know what this one times here is. So there's obviously a bit of learning we're gonna to need to know about this, these cards. I'll put it over there. We've got a bit of space to the right. So it says, first combat turn. Read the encounter card carefully. To win, you need to gather a number of markers in the combat pool equal to or higher than the encounter value. Well, that was four, if you remember. To gain these markers, you play combat cards from your hand. Prepare two help cards. One with the combat overview. Combat overview. And one with the combat and diplomacy icons. Da -da. Combat and diplomacy icons. Okay, so we've got those two cards ready to help us. 
Now let's go through your first combat step by step following the combat overview help card. Okay, that's what we will do. More than happy to do that. Remember, if you want to know more, you can find detailed descriptions of all cards and icons in the combat section of the rule book. Well, of course, we're going to draw three cards from a combat deck. Remember not to shuffle your deck in this tutorial. If you did, it says if you did tamper with the deck, you may recreate it by sorting Bjor's combat cards from one top card to 15. Card numbers are located along their bottom edge. Right, so let's have a look at our combat cards. Here they are. Did we keep them in the right order? Yes, we did. 15, 14, 13, etc, etc, etc. So, we are to draw three cards. That's going to be one, two and three. It is indeed one, two and three. You don't have to check the encounter's trait. It has none. And you don't need to pick an active character because we're alone, so only Bill can activate. You can also ignore the delayed ability step. There aren't any abilities in play yet. Time to fight. So we, I guess we're supposed to look at this combat overview. Starting the counter. Draw three cards from the combat deck. If there's four characters, draw two cards. Check the enemy traits. Pick the active character. Okay, so it's, it's already helped us out here. ID character activation. One. Delayed abilities. Remove one time token from each card. So we haven't got any. Play cards or receive an opportunity to play any one combat card from your hand. Play any number of additional combat cards. Each additional card needs to connect with the, whatever that little symbol is, bonus icon. After that, perform the victory check. If you didn't play any cards, resolve the opportunity attack listed on the encounter card. Then draw one combat card. Okay. Clear as mud. <laughs> Let's see. Play the attack card. Is that the first card? Yes, attack. Attach it to the right edge of the encounter card, as seen above. This causes both halves of the, like, fox bear head key and the bottom golden key to join. Okay. What's it talking about? Just like that. Okay. So we've put this here. In fact, let's see if we can't make a bit more space. I'm going to put the board over here. Can we still see it? I don't want to lose it from the, the game. There we go. And then we're going to put this combat here where we can see it a bit more clearly. Okay, so we do that. Let's just tilt this down a bit. So we play the attack card. We attach it to the right edge. This causes both halves of the, of the um, head and key and the bottom golden key to join. You may only connect keys with an attribute icon if you have this attribute. Bjor has two, I don't know what you call that, bear heads? Some kind of head, got that. This is, sorry, I'm being very vague. This is what I'm talking about, this, this symbol here. Yeah, he has two on his character tray. Can't see them personally, looking. Is it one of these? It's here where the aggression is. So he has two aggression up there on his character tray. You may only connect keys with an attribute icon if you have this attribute. Bill has two of that head on his character tray, so that key connects and grants you its bonus. Place one in your combat pool. So we place one cube in our combat pool. Where do we put our combat pool? I don't know. Okay, well, we'll just put, there's one. The golden bottom key always connects and has no requirements. Place one more cube in our combat pool. Okay, that's obviously because it says one times and it just has that, that cube. Now let's check the text of the attack card. It has two abilities. The first ability causes all enemy attacks to deal one more, and then it has this symbol. The second ability instructs you to place a whatever symbol that is on the attack card. The ability itself will be resolved during the next delayed ability step, unless you cover it up with another card first. So it's talking about these things down here. So that's draw one card, okay. Each turn you may play only one card, plus as many additional cards as you can connect using the bonus icons. Bonus action. I wonder if we've got any cards like that. We do have one here. This one has two bonus ones. 
Okay, I wonder if it's going to ask us to do that. Let's see. This means any further cards you play this turn would require you to connect the bonus. Play Ignore Pain. Right, that is the one we just looked at. It contains that symbol that connects to this symbol on the card. Preview card. Before placing this card, remove the this token thing from attack. Delayed abilities won't trigger if you cover them up, and you should never place cards on top of tokens or markers. Okay, well, we didn't actually put a token down, but uh, that's fine. Ignore Pain has two other keys. The blue magic key requires one magic to be connected. You do not have any magic at the moment, so you can't connect it. The free key contains a this one here. Contains this symbol. Yeah. Bonus icon, so draw one card. I'm not sure how it should line up exactly, but I, I suspect it's something like this. Yeah. So we're going to draw one card and we get this. I for detail. Put that with our other card. Ignore pain also contains a text ability. Just like a text ability, it triggers during the enemy's attack step. That's what the skull is for. It says we're going to gain a cube for every point of, I guess that's damage, that slash with the, the dripping. Every, every slash we receive, we're going to gain an extra cube. You have two cards left in your hand, but let's not cover the ignore pain card for now. Proceed to the next phase. A quick victory check. Right, a quick victory check shows that Bjorn didn't win yet. He has two markers in the combat pool out of a required four. It's time for the enemy attack. In Tainted Grail, each enemy has many different moves depending on the value of the combat pool. Bjorn currently has two markers in the combat pool. Check the combat table. It's down here. The attack for 0 to 2 markers deals 1 damage. And we can see that here. So 0 to 2 gives you 1 damage. So we need to move the health down by 1. Goes to 8. That's not all. Bjorn's Ignore Pain card modifies the enemy attack instructs you to add a marker for every point of damage received from the attack. So now we can add one more red cube to the combat pool. There we go, so we're now at three, and we need to get to four to win. During the end of turn, you must discard until you have three cards in your hand. You only have two cards in our hand, that's just combat cards, obviously, so this doesn't apply. Now we can draw one more combat card. Right, we draw that, we get powerful blow. Now we're on our second combat and the next turn begins. You could finish this battle quickly by playing Powerful Blow, but that would mean losing some energy as stated on the card. Let's start with the Battle Cry instead. Its free key, this one down at the bottom, contains that bonus, which means you draw one more card. So we put this down here. We get to draw another card. This is Throw. Okay, right there. You've now drawn the perfect card to end this encounter. Play the throw card. Right, okay, we'll play the throw card. You've now drawn it right, so we put this here because, oh, I see, because it's got the bonus. It's got the bonus up here. Doesn't match anything here, but it does have this tick. Flip over one weapon or shield you're using to gain two markers. This item is in, inactive until the end of combat. It says uh, it has the head icon there, so it can match up. Additionally, its free key gives you one more marker. That's just down here, we get one more marker. So we put that in. Perform the victory check. There are four markers in the combat pool, which means Bior has won. The loot is one food. So we can place one of these in the food. Now put the defeated encounter card at the bottom of its deck. In this tutorial, just place it face down near another, well, basically just somewhere else out of the way. So it's gone. Return all the played, drawn, or discarded cards to your combat deck and shuffle the deck. If you want to, you may play this encounter again, ignoring any health or energy losses to familiarize yourself with combat mechanics. 
If you're not sure about any of the rules, check the rulebook. You're going to have to check the rulebook because we've got a bunch of stuff going on here, like this blue thing with infinity and all that. It's like, what the heck is that all about? So obviously, I don't think this gets started tutorial guide. It gives you an idea, but I don't think it's quite full of information enough to let you just, you know, get stuck in completely. Ending the day, Bjor is wounded and has only two energy left. Yep, that's right, that's what our board says, two energy over here. If you look at the energy track slots marked as one and zero are red and have the exhausted sign, for now you don't want Bjor to become exhausted, so you should rest. Make a pass action, this will end your in-game day. Rest and eat, discard one food marker from Bjor's tray. Bjor gains one health, move his health marker one slot up. He doesn't lose any terror, as it's already at zero. Restore Bjor's energy to full and move the marker on the energy track back to six. So we discard a food, it's gone. We put the health back up. We restore energy to full. And that was everything it said. You don't have any experience points, so you can't advance your character. You also don't have any upgrade cards to modify your decks with. You're in a location with the, whatever that is symbol. So in a normal game, you would now open the exploration journal of this location and look for the dream. In this tutorial, read the dream from the tutorial journal instead. Remember to look at the correct section of the tutorial journal, 102 Hunter's Grove. Dreams contain both story text and rules. Remember to apply this dream's rules. So it says lose one energy. After you read the dream, a new day begins. Welcome back. Had to uh, take a pause of a couple of weeks there. Now reset in a new location. I think I have remembered where we we're up to. And we were just about to read. Let me just get this set a bit differently. We were just about to read the dream from the Hunter's Grove. As you walk into the shadow of the Hunter's Grove, your heart beats faster and your wound burns. You died not far from here two weeks ago though it took some time for you to realise that. You try hard not to think about those events, humming your favourite tune to chase away the memories. We go into the dream. In your dream, you return to the dark ravine deep in the grove. Like many others, you search for a little girl who went missing in Connacht. Instead, you find a mass of what looked like tangled black snakes crawling across the moss-covered stone. The mass rises on countless black legs and rushes at you, for a split second, you see the horrific truth. What charges is a malformed, overgrown, beating heart on countless legs of blackened veins and arteries. It opens its circular maw, full of lamprey-like teeth. Next moment, it's on top of you, ripping into your side and trying desperately to push itself into your chest. With all your strength, you pull it away from the wound, throw it to the ground, Hold it in place with your boot and crush it with a swing from your hammer. Then you wake up alone in the forest, shivering. The wound burns again. You ask the village priestess and the herbalist. You tried many remedies and quaffed foul-smelling mixtures. Still the wound festers, turning black. You try to fall asleep, but your mind dwells on what fate awaits you and whether a thing like the one that killed you will emerge from your chest once you die. I'm going to lose an energy, so I'll just move this down one to five. We're going to gain a terror, so that's going to go up to one. The prophetic dream caused Boar to lose a point of energy and gain a point of terror. Move the markers accordingly. After reading a dream or a nightmare, continue the game. In this case, go to part eight, start of the second day. It says Nightmare. Whenever a character's terror is in the red zone of the terror track, sleeping in locations with this symbol, Icon causes nightmares instead. So let's go to section 8. Start of the second day. Perform the start of day just like before. We reduce the Menir dial to 6, or Menir dial, however you pronounce it. So this is going to go down to... Oops, knocking everything in the process. All right, that's gone to six. Read the next event card. 
Tired and in pain, you start the final leg of your journey. Hint. Sometimes event cards have an additional impact on the game. Remember to apply any rules you find on them. Part 9. Entering the Whitening. Well, before we go to Part 9, let's just make sure we've done everything on the start of the day. Start of the day. Remove expired Meneers and discard locations that are out of Meneer range. Well, nothing to do there. Reduce all time and Meneer dials remove time tokens. Okay, we've done that. Reveal the next event card. Well, this is in the tutorial, so that's been taken care of. Move guardians. There aren't any guardians to move. Pick an active item and secret cards. Again, nothing that happens to happen there. Let's see then. Part 9. Entering the whitening. Travel right to location 107. We have to pay an energy to do so and move board to the whitening card. So, you can't really see Burl too well, He's uh, here he is behind this veneer. We're travelling to the Whitening, 107. We have to pay an energy to do so. So down comes the energy, now we're on four. No new locations are revealed, they would be too far from the Canuck veneer. If you remember, only locations within one position diagonally or orthogonally can be shown. The whitening has a sort of like an electric lightning bolt icon. This is an instant rule you must resolve as soon as you enter the location. The action instructs you to draw a blue encounter. Unlike your previous encounter, this is a diplomatic challenge. A very inquisitive guard stops you as you enter the location. Well, let's just have a look at the card first. So if we look at the card, we see Yep, draw a blue encounter when you enter this location. And then there's another thing we can pay an energy to trade with the townsfolk. We pay one food and gain one wealth. A bit of flavour text on the card. Once this place had another name and a busy market. Today, no one goes there. We need to draw a blue encounter card. It says make sure we have plenty of space to the right. Well, we can get rid of this combat that we did earlier that was resolved. So we get rid of all those cards. And we will place our blue encounter card in that position. Suspicious guard. What's this? Affinity track. If a marker is on top during the affinity check, you win. If it's on the bottom, you lose. Okay. Start. We need to put a marker here in the start position. We've got stage. Each stage resets the track and has different rules. Explain yourself. Varying bonus. Each weird symbol bonus you connect gives you this. Response. This will happen after your every turn. Okay, well, it doesn't make 100% sense to me just yet. I imagine it's going to be very similar to combat, but with diplomacy cards instead of combat cards. So we'll put that down there and we will read on to see what it says we do next. This is our first diplomacy turn. Diplomatic encounters are similar to combat encounters. The main difference is that instead of gathering points in the combat pool, you will engage in a tug of war on the affinity track visible on the left edge of the encounter card. Well, we just looked at that. That's here. Diplomatic encounters also don't have a combat table. Instead, they may have multiple stages. To win, you need to push the marker to the top of the affinity track in each stage. Fortunately, this encounter only has one stage. Prepare two help cards, one with the Diplomacy Overview. Got that one, Diplomacy Overview. Okay. And one with Combat and Diplomacy icons, which is this one. Okay, so we've got both of those ready to go. Then, place a marker on the grey slot of the affinity track. It's the starting point. Okay, so we put our grey marker... Uh, sorry, our red marker on that grey slot, the starting point. There we are. Draw three cards. Okay, well, we already have these in order because this is from the open and play deck. So we draw our three cards. Oops. I for detail... Backtrack, show off. Okay. 
we're going to play the eye for detail card. Okay, let's have a look. This is the eye for detail card. Only one key connects. It has the, whatever that weird symbol is, a special diplomacy bonus that varies depending on the encounter card and the stage of the encounter. In this stage, every one of those symbols yields one up. This means you move the mark on the affinity track one slot up. Then we need to place this time marker on the eye for detail card as it has a delayed ability. What's the delayed ability? Draw one card. So we place this here. Okay. We need one of those time tracking tokens. Okay, there's a time tracking token. Now it says that the, uh, the delayed ability is to draw one card. Right, so we've done this, a delayed up. It's time for the affinity check. The marker is not on the highest or lowest slot of the affinity track, so nothing happens. The opponent now responds. Move the marker one slot down. Time to end the turn, so it goes down one slot. Discard down to three cards in your hand, then draw one diplomacy card. Well, we only have two cards. So we draw one more, and we get misdirection. So add that to our hand. Now it's the second diplomacy turn. The new turn begins, and Bior has something to take care of in the delayed ability step. Remove the time token from the eye for detail card, then draw a card. So we can remove the token and we draw another Diplomacy card. This time we get Threatening Voice. We're going to play Misdirection. So Misdirection is going to attach like so. Okay, I think we can see a couple of interesting things here. We've got two times up. Um, this bonus here, I'm not sure what that does. Um, we've got if not sure what that symbol is, go down and lose one rep. Let's, let's go through what the tutorial says. It says, the new turn begins and Bjorn has something to take out. Yes, we've done that. Play misdirection as your first card. The bottom connects with a two times multiplier, granting you two up increases. One, two. Move the marker on the affinity track two slots up. We've done that. Then play Threatening Voice as your second card. The required bonus icon is in the bottom key of this card and connects. Okay, Threatening Voice. There's Threatening Voice. You can see the bonus icon down in the bottom. So we play that to the right. The text of this card, it says to lose one rep if you have at least two go up. It's just you to lose one rep, but you don't have any, so nothing happens. Also, if the character has at least two sort of attack heads, and Buell has, move the marker one slot up on the affinity track. Okay. Oh, I see, reputation. Sorry, what the reputation is actually just here on the tray. It's this middle, uh, middle space. That's what it means when it says we don't have any, because we haven't collected any uh, things to go in there yet. So when we perform the affinity check, the marker is now on the highest slot of the affinity track. This was the last and only stage, which means Boar wins. Well, I haven't got it on the very top, so I've messed something up. Let's have a look. Play misdirection. One, two. Oh, I see. You play that two, and then somehow I brought it down one. Then we play Threatening Voice. Text on this card says you should lose one, but you don't have any stuff in it. Also, if the character has at least two um, aggression, move the marker one slot up the affinity track. Yes, so we are at the top. Perform the affinity check. The marker is now on the highest slot of the affinity track. This was the last and only stage, which means Bjor wins and earns a reward. Place one marker in the reputation slot of Bjor's character tray. There we go. Well, the reward was what was on here. We get one rep. So, we can add that little red cube to the reputation space on the player board. We're supposed to put this on the bottom of the encounter deck, etc. But obviously, 
tutorial, we're not going to worry about that. Part 12, Entering the Whitening. In part 1 of this tutorial, Urfir asked Bior to bring him a meteorite ingot from the Whitening. So it's time to explore this location. We're going to pay 1 energy, so we're now down to 3. But instead of flipping the real Whitening location card, go to the appropriate section, it says and, but we know it should be the Go to the appropriate section of the Tutorial Exploration Journal at the end of the Exploration Journal book. Okay, we can do that. And here we are with some more text to read. 107, Whitening. The hole is here, as always, gaping at the heart of whitening. The white lichen that gives this town its new name seems to grow out of it. It covers the walls of the nearby halls with a thick coat. Only close up one can discover it is, in fact, a layer of small, sparkling crystals, like sea salt on the wooden posts of a pier. As you inspect it, several people watch you suspiciously. You shrug your arms to show them you're not interested in their secrets. Go to verse 7. There's no love lost between Canarct and the Whitening. You shouldn't stay here too long. We can either visit the village Tanner, in which case we go to verse 9, or ask the Whiteners about their manure and go to verse 5. Okay, so I think we just need to follow these through. So, what do we want to do? Visit the village Tanner or ask the Whiteners about their manure? Let, let's go to the Tanner first. Go to verse 9. You ask a round about the Tanner Urfa wanted you to find and draw some strange looks. Finally, someone tells you this man moved out several months ago. Angry and confused, you reach the tannery only to find the building abandoned and covered in cobwebs. What's going on? Was this a cruel joke? Gain one terror. Gain part two of the surprising Aaron status. Our exploration has ended. It says, gain a point of terror, then mark the second part of the status on the tutorial save sheet and continue the scenario. Go to part 13. Okay, so if we have got the second part of this surprise thing, where's the surprise thing gone? Oh, that is it. We just we just have that. that that's, yeah, that's it. So if I could be bothered, I could mark this as done. Now it says the way back. You have to go back to Connacht fast. Travel to Hunter's Grove as before, perform a travel action, pay one energy and move Bior to location 102. So we're going to pay another energy, we're down to two now and going back up here so you can see we are going to move Hunter's Grove. Bior only has two energy left just like the day before but this time Bior wants to travel as fast as possible even at the cost of exerting himself Okay, so if we just take a look at the board, you can see down here, we are literally just above where it goes red. But it says, perform another travel, pay one more energy and move to location 101. So we're going to move back to 101. We're going to pay this extra energy, which now puts us down into the red. Bureau is now back in his hometown, exhausted. Take a look at Boar's negative trait listed on his character tile. Festering wound. Lose one health every time you become exhausted. Well, we're in the exhausted section now. So he needs to lose a health. So we bring that down one. Tired and in pain, Bior is ready to conclude his journey. Pay one more energy. So we've got zero energy left now to explore Connacht. As before, go directly to the Tutorial Explanation Journal. Important, it says here, while this journal gives players a general grasp of the game, there are many additional rules it does not cover, such as parties and party actions, event cards, chapter setup, legacy locations, encounter traits, and so on. Before playing a full campaign, we encourage you to read the full rulebook at least once. Well, I better do that. So we need to go back to this book, to the tutorial section. Connacht Farmhold. This is the Exploration Journal. We've already read this flavour text. Now we make our choice. We speak with your master, which is only if you don't have part of the surprise there in status, or complete your mission requires part two, which we've got now. So part two, 
You enter Connaught exhausted and in pain, yet even in this condition you quickly realise something happened in your absence. Many sad-eyed townsfolk walk the streets or argue in small groups. Startled, you look towards the Meneer, but it seems fine, surrounded by ribbons flapping in the wind. There's no weirdness in Connaught, so what could draw all these people out of their houses? As you approach the forge, you almost stumble upon the boy who usually delivered her first messages. They're gone, the boy tells you. They left at the break of day. Irfa wants you to take care of his workshop. You stumble into the building only to find it empty, save for a note lying on the workbench, held securely in place by a heavy ingot of star iron. Three times you attempt to read the parchment, your eyes watering from helpless rage. It says Urfa left Connaught without you, travelling with Lord Yvain, Fail, Orbert. They headed for Camelot, where they hoped to find help for your town. You were deemed too weak for this journey, not good enough. A silent rage grows within you, gone are the exhaustion and the pain. You leave the forge and look to the east. Somewhere there, behind rolling mists, clouds of weirdness and dangerous trails, the Connaught champions journey on. You're sure you will find them. Each party member gains one terror. So I'll just move that on the board. Congratulations, you've finished the tutorial scenario. You will find Urfa's letter in the game box. It will prepare you for the first chapter of the Fall of Avalon campaign. Good luck in the bleak world of Tainted Grail. Okay, so it's the end of the tutorial section. I think it's it's given us a, a view of the basics, but yes, I, I do think we're gonna need to read the rule book, especially when it comes to all these icons and symbols for the combat and the diplomacy. I think uh, definitely some things to look at there. But not a bad idea to have a kind of a quick start tutorial like that to get us going. Quite like that. But for now, stay well. Take care. Bye-bye.